Chapter 9 of The Hairy Ones Shall Dance by Manly Wade Wellman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 To a terrified victim, he is doom itself. He leaned toward the bookshelf beside him, pawed for a moment, then laid two sizable volumes on the desk between us. If this were a fantasy tale, Mr. Wills, he said with a hint of one of his smiles, I would place before you an unthinkably rare book, one that offered in terms too brilliant and compelling for argument the awful secrets of the universe, past, present, and to come. He paused to polish a pair of pince nez and to clamp them upon the bridge of his broad nose. However, he resumed, this is reality, sober if uneasy, and I'll give you not some forgotten grimoire out of the mystic past, but two works by two recognized and familiar authorities. I eyed the books. May I see? For answer, he thrust one of them, some six hundred pages in dark blue cloth, across the desk and into my hands. Thirty years of psychical research by the late Charles Richet, French master in the spirit investigation field, he informed me, faithfully and interestingly translated by Stanley de Broth, published here in America in 1923. I took the book and opened it. I knew Professor Richet slightly, uh, years ago, when I was just beginning this sort of thing, I was entertained by him in London. He introduced me to Conan Doyle. Well, then you're probably familiar with his book, yes? Well, the other, and he took up the second volume, almost as large as the Richet, and bound in light buff, is by Montague Summers, whom I call the premier demonologist of today. He's gathered all the lycanthropy lore available. I had read Mr. Summers' Geography of Witchcraft in his two essays on the vampire, and I made bold to say so. This is a companion volume to them, Judge Pursuivant told me, opening the book. It is called The Werewolf. He scrutinized the flyleaf. Published in 1934. Thoroughly modern, you see. Here's a bit of Latin, Mr. Wills. Intrabunt lupa repassus in vos non parsentes gregi. I crinkled my brow in the effort to recall my high school Latin, then began slowly to translate, a word at a time. Enter hungry wolves. Save that scholarship, Judge Pursuivant broke in. It's more early scripture, though not so early as the bit about the hairy ones. Uh, vulgate for a passage from the Acts of Apostles, 20th chapter, 29th verse. Ravenous wolves shall enter among you, not sparing the flock. Apparently that disturbing possibility exists even today. He leafed through the book. Do you know he asked, that Summers gives literally dozens of instances of lycanthropy, things that are positively known to have happened. I took another sip of whiskey and water. Those are only legends, surely. They are nothing of the sort. The judge's eyes protruded even more in his earnestness, and he tapped the pages with an excited forefinger. There are four excellent cases listed in his chapter on France alone, sworn to, tried, and sentenced by courts. But weren't they during the Middle Ages? I suggested. He shook his great head. No, during the 16th century, the peak of the Renaissance. Oh, don't smile at the age, Mr. Wills. It produced Shakespeare, Bacon, Montaigne, Galileo, Leonardo, Martin Luther, Descartes, and Spinoza were its legitimate children, and Voltaire built upon it. Yet werewolves were known, seen, convicted. Convicted on what grounds? I interrupted quickly for I was beginning to reflect his warmth. For answer, he turned more pages. Well, here is the full account of the case of Stubb Peter, or Peter Stumpf, he said. A contemporary record telling of Stumpf's career in and out of wolf form, his capture in the very act of shifting shape, his confession and execution, all near Cologne in the year 1589. Listen. He read aloud. Witnesses that this is true. Tass Artine, William Brewer, Adolf State, George Bors, with divers others that have seen the same. Slamming the book shut, he looked up at me, the twinkle coming back into his spectacled eyes. Well, Mr. Wills, how do those names sound to you? Why, like the names of honest German citizens. Exactly. Honest, respectable, solid. And their testimony is hard to pass off with a laugh, even at this distance in time, eh? He had almost made me see those witnesses, leather-jerkened and broad-breached, with heavy jaws and squinting eyes, taking their turn at the quill-pen with 
which they set their names to that bizarre document. With divers others that have seen the same, perhaps too frightened to hold pen or make signature. Still, I said slowly, Germany of the Renaissance, the 16th century, and there have been so many changes since. Werewolves have gone out of fashion, you mean. Oh, you admit they might have existed. He fairly beamed his triumph. So have beards gone out of fashion, but they will sprout again if we lay down our razors. Let's go at it another way. Let's talk about materialization, ectoplasm, for the moment. He relaxed, and across his great girth his fingertips sought one another. Suppose you explain briefly and simply what ectoplasm is considered to be. I was turning toward the back of Richet's book. It's here, Judge Pursuivant. To be brief and simple, as you say, certain mediums apparently exude an unclassified material called ectoplasm. This, at first light and vaporescent, becomes firm and takes shape either upon the body of the medium or as a separate and living creature. And you don't believe in this phenomenon, he prompted with something of insistence. I have never said that I didn't, I replied truthfully even before my experience of this evening went so far toward convincing me. But with the examples I have seen, I felt that true scientific control was lacking. With all their science, most of the investigators trust too greatly. Judge Pursuivant shook with gentle laughter. They are doctors for the most part, and this honesty of theirs is a professional failing that makes them look for it in others. You, begging pardon, are a magician, a professional deceiver, and you expect trickery in all whom you meet. Perhaps a good lawyer with trial experience, with a level head and a sense of competent material evidence for both sides, should attend these seances, eh? You're quite right, I said heartily. But returning to the subject, what else can be said about ectoplasm? That is, if it actually exists. I had found in Richet's book the passage for which I had been searching. It says here that Bits of ectoplasm have been secured in rare instances, and that some of these have been examined microscopically. There were traces of fatty tissue, bacterial forms, and epithelium. Ah, those were the findings of Shrink Notzing. A sound man, and a brilliant one, hard to corrupt a fool. It makes ectoplasm sound organic, does it not? I nodded agreement, and my head felt heavy as if full of sober and important matters. As for me, I went on, I never have had much chance to examine the stuff. Whenever I get hold of an ectoplasmic hand, it melts like butter. Mm, they generally do, the judge commented, or so the reports say. Yet they themselves are firm and strong when they touch or seize. Right, sir. It's when attacked or even frightened, as with a camera flashlight, that the ectoplasm vanishes or is reabsorbed he prompted further. So Roche says here, I agreed once more, and so I have found. Very good. Now, and his manner took on a flavor of the legal, I shall sum up. Ectoplasm is put forth by certain spirit mediums, who are mysteriously adapted for it, under favorable conditions that include darkness, quiet, self-confidence. It takes form, altering the appearance of the medium or making up a separate body. It is firm and strong, but vanishes when attacked or frightened. Right so far, eh? Right, I approved. Now, for the word medium, substitute wizard. His grin burst out again, and he began to mix a third round of drinks. A wizard, having darkness and quiet, and being disposed to change shape, exudes a material that gives him a new shape and character. Maybe it is bestial to match a fierce or desperate spirit within. There may be a shaggy pelt, a sharp muzzle, taloned paws and rending fangs. To a terrified victim, he is doom itself. But to a brave adversary facing and fighting him, he flipped his way through Summer's book as I had with Richet's, listen, the shape of the werewolf will be removed if he be reproached by name as a werewolf, or if again he be thrice addressed by his Christian name, or struck three blows on the forehead with a knife, or that three drops of blood should be drawn. 
do you see the parallels, man? Shouted at, bravely denounced, or slightly wounded, his false beast substance fades from him. He flung out his hands as though appealing to a jury. I marvel. Nobody ever thought of it before. But nothing so contrary to nature has a natural explanation, I objected. And very idiotic the phrase sounded in my own ears. He laughed, and I could not blame him. I'll confound you with another of your own recent experiences. What could seem more contrary to nature than the warmth and greenness of the inside of Devil's Croft? And what is more simply natural than the hot springs that make it possible? Yet an envelope of bestiality, beast muzzle on human face, beast paws on human hands? I can support that by more werewolf lore. I don't even have to open Summers. Everyone has heard the story. A wolf attacks a traveler, who with his sword lops off a paw. The beast howls and flees, and the paw it leaves behind is a human hand. And that's an old one in every language. Probably because it happens so often. There's your human hand with the beast paw forming upon and around it, then vanishing like wounded ectoplasm. Where's the weak point, Wills? Name it, I challenge you. I felt the glass shake in my hand, and a chilly wind brushed my spine. There's one point, I made myself say. You may think it a slender one, even a quibble, but ectoplasms make human forms, not animal. How do you know they don't make animal forms? Judge Pursuant crowed, leaning forward across the deck. Because of the few you've seen and disbelieved, only human faces and bodies showed? My reply is, there in your hands. Open Roche's book to page 545, Mr. Wills. Page 545. Got it? Now, the passage I marked about the medium Burgic. Read it aloud. He sank back into his chair once more, waiting in manifest delight. I found the place, underscored with pencil, and my voice was hoarse as I obediently read. My trouser leg was strongly pulled, and a strange ill-defined form that seemed to have paws like those of a dog or a small monkey climbed on my knee. I could feel its weight very light, and something like the muzzle of an animal touched my cheek. There you are, Wills, Judge Pursuivant was crying. Notice that it happened in Warsaw, close to the heart of the werewolf country. Hmm? Reading that passage made you sweat a bit. Remembering what you saw in the Devil's Croft, eh? I flung down the book. You've done much toward convincing me, I admitted. I'd rather have the superstitious peasant's belief, though, the one I've always scoffed at. Rationalizing the business didn't help, then. It did when I explained the Devil's Croft in the springs. But the springs don't chase you with sharp teeth. And, as I was saying, the peasant had a protection that the scientist lacks— trust in his crucifix and his Bible. Why shouldn't he have that trust, and why shouldn't you? Again the judge was rummaging in his bookcase. Those symbols of faith gave him what is needed, a strong heart to drive back the menace, whether it be wolf demon or ectoplasmic bogey. Here, my friend. He laid a third book on the desk. It was a Bible, red-edged and leather-backed, worn from much use. Have a read at that while you finish your drink, he advised me. The gospel according to St. John is good, and it's already marked. Play you're a peasant, hunting for comfort. Like a dutiful child, I opened the Bible to where a faded purple ribbon lay between the pages. But already Judge Pursuivant was quoting from memory. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. End of chapter 9